Hi, my name is Sam. I'll talk to you about some uh, numerical models of fluid flow that I've been conducting around uh, <laughs> magmatic intrusions, uh, focusing in particular on supercritical fluid in the near vicinity of the magma chamber. So uh, the kinds of systems that I'm discussing are the so-called high enthalpy geothermal systems, like what you see in New Zealand or Iceland. Um, these uh, systems are typically boiling to depths of one to three kilometers, and temperatures in these systems follow the boiling point with depth curve, as you can see on the right. Um, at temperatures above 374 degrees, you no longer have liquid and vapor uh, boiling, but instead a single phase supercritical fluid. Um, these systems are, are used for power generation, and conventional wells uh, get about five megawatts of energy per, per well. So, supercritical geothermal resources have attracted a lot of attention in uh, recent years because of the potential for dramatically increased power production. Um, and we consider supercritical fluid to be uh, fluid at a temperature and enthalpy greater than the critical values. Uh, such fluids were discovered recently um, by the Iceland Deep Drilling Project when they drilled into a magmatic intrusion beneath the Kropla volcano in Iceland. And you can see on this pressure enthalpy diagram for water the uh, measured reservoir values for the IDDP-1 well. And so the main question of my research is whether or not uh, these kinds of uh, fluid resources are a normal feature of geothermal systems and um, what geologic factors govern their formation and thermal hydraulic state. And so I'm running numerical models to, to test the effect of first order geologic factors like host rock permeability and intrusion depth. So, we're performing our simulations using the uh, CSMP++ code, which has a control volume finite element approach to solving the governing equations. And here you can see uh, our finite element mesh, uh, showing our domain and the boundary conditions. Um, we model the instantaneous emplacement of a, an elliptical heat source that's uh, initially two kilometers wide and one kilometer tall, and is the top of the uh, heat source is at a depth of two and a half kilometers in the example results that I'll discuss. Um, initially, this is at 900 degrees, and fluid pressure inside the intrusion is lithostatic. A key feature of our simulations is that we adopt the uh, formulation of Haiba and Ingebrigtsen, 1994, of uh, temperature-dependent permeability um, to, to mimic the effect of the brittle ductal transition. And uh, the brittle ductal transition temperature depends on the lithology that you're considering. In the Haiba and Ingebrigtsen study, they uh, assumed that permeability began to be reduced from the host rock value at 360 degrees Celsius. This is a good assumption for granitic rocks, for quartz bearing rocks, but for basaltic rocks, this temperature can be much higher. And so I also test the effect of shifting this brittle ductal transition temperature to 450 or 550 degrees Celsius. So, First, I'd just like to show some example results to show the transient uh, character and transient nature of our simulations. And so what this little movie will show is uh, the evolution of a simulated geothermal system. The solid colors show the fluid phase state, so gray um, being a single phase fluid of liquid-like density, blue being a single phase fluid of vapor-like density, and red solid red, which you don't see now, but which will appear, representing boiling two-phase liquid and vapor. The solid blue lines represent pressure isobars with a 50-bar uh, contour interval, and the red lines represent um, isotherms. So, What you'll see is a, a number of small upflow plumes develop initially on the margins of the intrusion and will gradually merge uh, over the center of the intrusion as the intrusion uh, gets smaller. Uh, and we analyze our results after this uh, central upflow zone has formed um, in order to facilitate comparison between different, uh, different uh, geological configurations. 
And so uh, first I'd just like to show some example results for uh, a system that has a brittle ductal transition temperature of 360 degrees Celsius and a host rock permeability of 10 to the minus 15 uh, square meters, which is a reasonable assumption for crystalline basement in these kinds of settings. Um, and what this figure shows, I'd like to particularly draw your attention to this red zone, which uh, is considered to be potentially exploitable supercritical fluid. And so potentially exploitable supercritical fluid is water that has a temperature and enthalpy greater than the critical values and is also in rock with a permeability greater than 10 to the minus 16 square meters. And we use this value as a cutoff for um, supercritical resources because uh, it is, previous studies have shown that um, advective heat transport is very limited below this permeability and it's instead dominated by conductive heat transport. Um, and what you can see in this case is that because of the brittle ductal transition temperature is 360 degrees Celsius, um, which is pretty close to the critical uh, temperature, the uh, supercritical fluid is rather uh, limited in extent. And this is because of the low brittle ductal transition temperature. And this permeability of 10 to the minus 16 square meters is reached only uh, about 20 to 25 degrees above this uh, brittle ductal transition temperature. So this limits the, the, the formation of, of sizable resources. Uh, however, if you, if you keep the host rock permeability constant but increase the brittle ductal transition temperature to 450 degrees Celsius, you can see that this zone of potentially exploitable supercritical fluid, um, the dimensions increase dramatically and can uh, extend uh, almost 500 meters above the, the center of the intrusion. Um, and this would, in, in, in addition, the system is much hotter as, as a whole. Um, and so this kind of behavior would be more like what we expect for a basaltic system that has a higher brittle ductal transition temperature as previous work has shown. And yes, you can, as you see, sizable resources can form in the vicinity of the intrusion. If we keep the brittle ductal transition temperature at 450 degrees Celsius but increase the host rock permeability by an order of magnitude, the uh, dimensions of the supercritical fluid resource um, are, are much lower and much more restricted uh, just to the, the top of the intrusion. And um, this, this behavior is a consequence of the fact that the host rock permeability is, is so much higher and this allows for much more rapid fluid circulation in the near vicinity of the intrusion. And this means that uh, in the process of being heated up the, and, and flowing towards the intrusion and up flowing away from the intrusion, fluid does not pick up as much uh, enthalpy and is not heated to as much as high of a temperature just because of the fact that the, the fluid circulation is much more rapid. Um, and so even though the dimensions of the supercritical fluid resource are, are much smaller compared to the 10 to the minus 15 square meters case, uh, the mass fluxes of supercritical fluid in the near vicinity of the intrusion are much greater because the host rock permeability is an order of magnitude higher. Uh, a good way to uh, understand the role of permeability on, on fluid mixing and the size of the supercritical uh, resource is to implement uh, passive tracers which can follow the movement of supercritical fluid through the geothermal system and that's what we did in this study and here I'm comparing results uh, following the, the, the amount of uh, passive tracer for a, a, a system with a permeability of 10 to the minus 14 square meters, a high permeability on the left and an intermediate permeability on the right. And uh, what you can see is that for a high permeability system at the depths uh, typically associated with uh, geothermal production, so around two kilometers, uh, roughly half of the fluid mass uh, has been, had come from fluid that was at one point heated to supercritical conditions. Um, for an intermediate permeability system uh, in the core of this up, the upflow, this uh, fraction can increase to uh, close to 90 percent. Um, and so what you're seeing is that in the, in the high permeability system, the supercritical fluid coming from the intrusion is just being mixed 
to a greater extent with lower temperatures circulating waters in the process of upflowing away from the intrusion, while uh, in the intermediate permeability case, the, the um, mixing is not as strong, and in addition, the supercritical resources are larger. In addition, you can also see the fluid uh, specific enthalpy contours on these plots, and they follow the distribution of the tracer, which indicates that um, supercritical fluid is actually distributing energy uh, and, and enthalpy in these systems. Um, and this is a, a, a completely new way to look at uh, conventional geothermal resources as, um, as fluid that was, or at least a large amount of the fluid being produced was at some point coming from supercritical, or water that was at supercritical conditions. And uh, yeah, this shows also the important role of fluid mixing in these systems. So in summary, um, I've just presented some uh, numerical simulations that uh, test the effect of basic geologic factors on the extent of, of supercritical fluid resources, and we uh, determine that a permeability near 10 to the minus 15 square meters, a brittle ductal transition temperature um, above 450 degrees Celsius, and a shallow depth of intrusion all promote these kinds of resources. And um, if it's, and since these kinds of values are, are reasonable assumptions for many systems, this, going back to our original question, this would indicate that supercritical fluid resources could indeed be a key feature in many, many geothermal systems. Um, in addition, you can see on the, uh, on a, a way to summarize the results is to uh, plot the thermal structure of geothermal systems. Uh, assuming different conditions of brittle ductal transition temperature and host rock permeability on the pressure enthalpy diagram. And so the solid blue line shows a system with uh, high permeability and relatively low brittle ductal transition temperature. And this system only uh, intersects the, uh, only boils at, at shallow, relatively shallow depths because it's uh, picked up relatively low enthalpy or relatively little enthalpy in the vicinity of the intrusion and has been uh, mixed to a greater extent in the process of upflow. While for um, a, per a system with a permeability of, of 10 to the minus 15 square meters or a system with a higher brittle ductal transition temperature, these systems can boil over the entire depth range. Um, in addition, you can see that for these systems that do boil, they have similar uh, similar thermal state um, at temperatures below 300 degrees Celsius, but at higher temperatures, depending on the values of these geologic controls, the extent and thermal state of the supercritical resource can be dramatically different. So for a high permeability system, represented by the, the solid red line and high brittle ductal transition temperature, this evolves quickly from supercritical to boiling conditions, and this is a result of this increased degree of fluid mixing. While for uh, an intermediate permeability system, this transition occurs over, more gradually over a larger pressure range. In addition, this diagram shows that the, if you assume values for the geologic controls that are appropriate for the, uh, the Kropla volcano, we can reproduce the thermal state of the, uh, I, the thermal hydraulic conditions that were measured in the IDDP-1 well. Um, and this is an encouraging ro result, both in, time, in terms of the fact that it gives us confidence that our models are, are, are meaningful, and that also that our conclusion that the geologic controls play a large role in governing the characteristics of supercritical resources are, are correct, or is correct. Um, and so this match is uh, an encouraging result. So. That's all I have for you today. Thanks.
Yeah. At, at every time step, the, the, the permeability is calculated according to this temperature dependence. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, what does it mean when you reach this reconductor transition temperature, then mm -hmm. the will just drop? Yeah, so we have a, a function where permeability decreases in a log linear fashion above the, below the um, host rock value once this brittle ductal transition temperature is reached. Um, and I would refer you to Haiba and Ingebrigtsen in 1994, mm -hmm. their study, because we adopt the same formulation but only allow the brittle ductal transition temperature to be changed. So while they assumed a, a, a fixed value. So, yeah. yeah. Well, if there's no other question then. <laughs>